There you go. There you go. Okay. Um, <coughs> all right. Yeah. Um, we're good to go. So, um, as everybody, this is Herbert Dan. Kind of doesn't need much of an introduction. The creator of Voyager, Spaceship One, and founder of Scale Composites. Okay. Uh, what do we got for schedule? Because uh, uh, we got this slideshow is kind of a little revision of one that's too long for today, and I'll. Kind of flashcard through some of it. We got uh, until five for my class and however late you guys want to stay. So, but you know, but you want to go over and look at the airplane yep. too. Yeah, so, 45 so minutes, 45 maybe do 45 minutes, minutes or so here and then the time to get over there and look yep. at the airplane and describe it. Yep. Okay, very good. Uh, what I've put together here is, is something that I put together for a uh, um, a couple of months ago for the Seaplane Pilots Association of Washington, who showed up at Priest Lake and, and did a big fly-in with something like, uh, I don't know, 25 or so seaplanes. That was kind of cool. And I, I put a couple of structural things on the end of it, because this is a structures class. Or an A and P class. Uh, it's both. We got both. the airframe students and the air okay. composites guy in here. As well. well, there's there's some. Uh, there's a couple of things about Ski Goal that are brand new in terms of composite structural design. So I put a couple slides in to kind of share that with you on the end of it. So uh, I, it's my 47th uh, airplane and my 46th composite airplane. <laughs> so After it took me four or five years to build very big and out of wood, and aluminum, I, uh, I found a way to, to build it much quicker because my my uh, my real passion was flight test. I went to college in uh, Cal Poly and uh, I had been a model airplane guy since I was just little and it was a passion. I'd go out and win trophies at control line contests and all that stuff. You know, and, so when I went to college, I, <coughs> I wanted to be an airplane designer. Got out of school and uh, took my lowest paying job to $7,070 per year. In 1965, 51 years ago. And uh, what I did was uh, flight test airplanes. I thought it would be a good idea to do flight tests because you learn a lot real quick and then be an airplane designer. Because <laughs> if you go to work for Boeing and you say, I want to be, I'm a new engineer on college, I want to be an airplane designer, about the only thing you're going to do for the first few years is design like a door or compile a bunch of numbers or, or run structural analysis. You, know, you don't really get to design airplanes. And I wanted to design airplanes. So I decided to take a job during the Vietnam War, I worked for the Air Force, and I flight tested Air Force airplanes while well, we had a real hot war going on. And you know, the historians have probably taught you that Vietnam wasn't a very good war, but uh, from the standpoint of, of airplanes and development, it was actually a very good war because it was a lot of activity. Uh, we developed a whole bunch of things that would help the troops survive and help us go out in the jungle and, and, and kill the bad guys. So there were all kinds of new airplanes, helicopters, you know, the big airplane like the C-5 cargo airplane, a bunch of fighters. So it was a real active time period, a lot of fun for us that were developing and flight testing new airplanes. Nowadays, you get one or two new airplanes every decade if they're fighters. You know, we had we had probably 15 of them over a four or five year time period. So a lot of activity. That worked. And uh, after that uh, seven years, I, I decided to go out and start, start my own company and start developing airplanes. So anyway, let me just kind of flash through this. Is this uh, uh, I think it has to be turned on. Just on the side piece there, on the side of it, just turn side. it on up top there. 
That should work now. Where's the forward? Over here, Gus? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I'm just going to go through this and kind of give you a snapshot of what, what the Eagle is all about. It's supposed to operate off of water. It had problems initially. Uh, and don't have time to go into all of them, but but uh, I did I, I made some real mistakes on the hydrodynamics, and uh, took it out of the water with my tail between my legs, and and went brought it up to the airport and decided to, to fly it off a of runways to test it. But anyway, here we are. Uh, it's rotable, very long wings. It's actually classified as a motor glider. What that does is it gives you t extreme range. Uh, you know, like 62 nautical miles per gallon, and on on 40 gallons, you can go a long ways. You know, like like almost 3,000 miles. So uh, it's meant to explore, and that it it should be able to go through in the water and snow or grass or runways or anything. It also should be real quiet. You can fly over it less than a thousand feet, and people can't hear it on the ground. So I'm planning to sneak into a lot of places with it. <laughs> uh, it uses car gas or boat gas, so you don't have to go to airports. So if you're out in the Pacific, you might be able to operate like the sailboats do. They, they, they put their sailboat on a beach and go to get groceries and press on. If you're in an airplane, you've got to land at the international airport and pay the fees, file flight plans, and go through customs and all that garbage, you know, so I'm hoping to use it kind of like a boat. So um, like what engine did you put in it? This is a Rotax 912 IS. It's a really state-of-the-art fuel injection version of the normal Rotax that you see. Okay. And it is just phenomenal fuel, fuel economy, which I need for long range. Uh, I put uh, the water skis, I put little wheels on it. Uh, so I could operate off of runways, and the mistake I made was those are the skis have to deflect a full three feet to to handle rough water. By the way, it's the only it's the only float plane that that has shock absorption on hitting the water. They all they all, you know you have on an airplane you have maybe that much stroke in your landing gear, uh, and you land on smooth runways. Well, seaplanes you land on real rough runways. And uh, if it's smooth, you can't tell how high you are, so you make hard landings on if the, if the runway water is smooth. Bottom line, a seaplane needs a lot of shock absorption, and there isn't one that has it. So yeah, that, was, that was my basic idea for that. Uh, unfortunately, being so flexible, this landing gear didn't work. And uh, Trevor and I have spent quite a bit of time the last, uh, the last uh, ooh, eight months or so. Uh, what we did is move the sponsons, uh, put an addition on it, about eight inches, and put a, ma a regular landing gear, main gear and a nose gear on it, and leaving the skis on it. There's the skis. This is weird. I mean, see, uh, you touch the water here, and you got a lot of stroke. So that, in, in if you've, how many here have, have landed on water in an airplane, or even as a passenger water? Okay, you remember, if you see any roughness out there, it doesn't go kind of poom poom, it goes bam, 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 and you think you're, the seaplane's coming apart, because water acts a little bit like concrete if you hit it very fast. You know, it's like diving, well, whatever. And so, um, the idea here is I can even go into ocean crests. Another thing real special about this airplane is it's the only small seaplane, excuse me, it's the only seaplane it's saltwater compatible. Aluminum just disappears in saltwater. Any seaplane that goes into the ocean, they have to they have to land in a freshwater lake, put the gear down, flush it all out. If they don't have that, they have to take a fire hose to it to flush out that salt uh, uh, environment, or their airplane will just deteriorate and become totally worthless. I've had several friends that have it, real neat seaplanes that have had to scrap them because of saltwater. So anyway, this is composite or titanium. It has no aluminum on it except for things that you could replace sitting on a beach, like the tank for the for the uh, uh, pneumatic system runs the gear up and down. It's a little unusual. It turned out to be a lot harder than I thought to build an airplane without any aluminum. 
Because I'll tell you, titanium is a lot harder to drill and, and uh, machine and uh, whatever. But it's mostly fiberglass and carbon fiber. This gives you an idea how much uh, wingspan it has. 47 feet on a little two-place airplane. It's got a lot of baggage compartment. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, this is the uh, docking motors. Let me go. Whoops. I must have skipped a couple. Oh, it's here. These are these are electric motors. Propeller that big around. And the motor that big around. It's an outrunner electric motor. Uh, let's see, they're uh, uh, German hackers. Something like 13 horsepower. And these motors are made so that you can sit there and milk them either forward or back. And you can back, uh, trying to dock in a, in a wind is really hard. What do you do with a little float plane? You kind of aim at the dock, hope you got the right speed, you shut off the engine, and you jump out there with a rope and a, and a, and a, a panel and a prayer. <laughs> and hopefully have somebody at the dock can grab you and keep you from the wind blowing you back out. So it is tough. So I plan to be able to just sit in the cockpit and run these with a joystick so that I can turn it around or back it up or go forward and really make it a lot easier to beach it or dock it. Okay, now if you have these though, with the, they're, they're a little unit with all the batteries right in the unit and the controller and the motor and a firewall because sometimes the lithium batteries want to do bad things. Yeah. So you have to keep it from burning your wing off. So the whole thing, this whole, this whole thing here is that big around about that long. Okay, and here it is, we're, we're testing it with a, the propeller, 30 inch prop. Uh, I don't have, we don't have the folding props yet, which you need, of course, but this is just testing it with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, it's a club prop. The kind of neat thing about it is if you have these for docking, if you're real heavy and you're at high altitude and you've got two people in baggage and you're trying to take off, uh, where most of these little seaplanes can't get off the water unless it's real cold or unless they have to leave their, uh, their deer that they shot behind. Uh, uh, you just push the button and you get 20% more thrust by turning these two on. And then it helps you up onto the skis so you can get off. Another thing is a real big safety thing. How many here are light plane pilots? Okay. When you fly around on a single engine airplane, you, you, you don't tell your passengers this, but you're always looking for, was that engine quit right now, where am I going to land? How am I going to save my life? And secondary, how am I going to save my airplane? If the engine quits. You just think about that. It's just in your psyche. And again, pilots don't like to scare the passengers, so they don't tell you that. <coughs> well, the neat thing about this, First of all, by having a big wing, a little seaplane, if you lose the engine, it's going to land down here. It can only go about six times as far as its altitude, which isn't very far, gliding. Mm -hmm. Well, this big wing, it can go like 12 or 13 times its altitude. Okay, And the amount of places you can land is a square of that difference because you, know, you, know, you can go to a lot of different places. And the other cool thing about it, you pick out the field you're going to glide into and land. If you're a little short and going to hit the trees, well, you just turn on the motors for a couple of seconds and get up there, right? Or if you're long, you can't get put down, you're going to hit the trees at the end, just put them in reverse. So it's a safety thing. And in fact, you can, with these docking motors, if you get down and you feel that found out that the field you selected is full of cows, now a lot of us like beef, but but <laughs> that, 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 running into a cow will really hurt you, and, and so uh, uh, they're they're not real soft when you hit them at 60 knots. So so what you do, you push that button and get full power out of these, and you can actually climb the downwind and go find another field. So this is a real big safety thing. We don't have it on the airplane yet, but it's going to be a big thing I want to, I want to develop and finish developing. 
Okay, I need to go fast. See how big the skis are? And this light blue thing is the addition that Trevor, Trevor and I added to put the main landing gear on. Uh, main landing gear is titanium metal parts, a pneumatic actuator, and a fiberglass landing gear. Those gear is carbon fiber. The, the gear has to be fiberglass because if you make carbon strong enough, it's too stiff to flex properly. With fiberglass, it, it's, it's a good choice because it gives you the right softness of the gear. But it's something else. The landing gear looks like a ski as it goes back like this. The neat thing about that is several of my friends here, since I've moved up here in local areas, have landed a seaplane with a landing gear down in water. And it flips it right over in the back. The most popular fatality with light seaplanes is they forget and put their gear down, land, land in the water, and they get knocked unconscious and they drown. So that's, that's a, a big deal. This airplane, I believe, can land on water with the gear down and not flip over. So that's... that's uh, we'll determine that. Test you first. Okay, the nose gear is like that too. It's like a ski in front. Uh, so we just built some bulkheads and the gear and essentially glued it on the outside of this Bunsen. And you can get about 200 uh, pounds per inch per ply of just a little corner tape. So if you go and put these Fiberglass, just just basic, you know, not vacuum bag or anything, just basic little layups, gluing those on to get real big strength margins. Okay, there's Trevor acting as a test director. Got the <laughs> engine running. We're out with the, with the gear down. And I finally found a day that looked good. I called up my test pilot, and he said, oh, I can't come, I'm busy, and plus I don't have a parachute anymore. So I'm sitting out there, well, what am I going to do? You know, well, well, I'm waiting to get the parachute, and, and, uh, and there's three different pilots who, who I want to be able to fly it. Uh, I don't have a medical, so I'm not legal to fly it, but you know, nobody was looking. <laughs> <laughs> I found out that if you had taken taxi and airplane above the stall speed and then pull back on the stick, it'll actually fly without an airman's medical. <laughs> I could be wrong about it. I haven't done it, but I'm uh, you know, an engineer can guess it. Anyway, I, I did go out you know, myself and do the, uh, uh, I did some stall tests below the stall speed because you can raise the nose gear and stall the wing. So we put tufts on the wing. See the, these pieces of yarn? Okay. And when it's sitting on its tail, it's, it's more angle of attack than stall. So I was able to, with GoPro, oh, they're not shown here. You'll see it later. There, uh, there's a post up here with two GoPros, one looking at each wing. And uh, so I could get video data on the tops. And uh, here it is with the nose gear off the ground. And it's further away, but you can see it here with the tail almost on the ground. And a unqualified... Uh, low recent proficiency pilot taxiing, not flying, it was legal. And here's uh, the left wing and the right wing at low angle attack. You can see the yarn all laid down. And here it is at stall. Anytime you see a tough wiggling or going the wrong way, that wing is stalled and producing very little lift. So here you've got essentially the whole wing stalled. And the differences that we see in the tufts here showed us why the airplane, when we flew it a year ago and did stalls, it, the right wing would drop. So we're in the process of putting on vortex generators and adjusting the wing incidents to solve that. And as soon as I can get a, I do a parachute now, as soon as I can get some good weather and, uh, and get back on this, from this trip, I gotta take tomorrow morning uh, for a week. Uh, why we'll, we'll go out and do, do as much flight test as we can. Uh, well, as long as it doesn't have to shovel too much snow out from under the door. So I'm not used to this because I come from the desert. Okay, here's the thing that's really different about ski golf. This is a single part made on a flat table with just little wooden dams. The black things are carbon toe. Do you work with carbon toe here? 
yeah. like fiberglass roving, carbon fiber. And the other things are fiberglass. This is not a bag layup. It's actually a contact layup. No, no vacuum bagging. It would be better if it was vacuum bag. But it's one part that has the hard points for the wing struts, hard points for the uh, for the uh, uh, actuator that puts the skis down, place to put the sills on. It has the main bulkhead for the fuselage, the main bulkhead for the sponsons. It has a main spar for the sponson wing, the wing that goes out to the sponsons. It has the main spar for the indoor wing right up to where the wing fold mount is. And it has the main spar for the pylon. And it's all one piece. And we laid it up in five hours and walked away. And we've got something that's totally aligned. You don't have to separately align a pylon to a fuselage and a fuselage to a sponson wing. And you see what I'm getting at? And these are the very best joints you can do because instead of taking two spars like this, which you'll see on almost every airplane, and you glue it and then put four bolts in it, uh, the spar cap here, as it crosses the spar cap here, it doesn't do like this. It crosses like this. In other words, you lay that carbon toe down, and then the next one you lay is this way. So you cross it. So there's no out-of-plane bending. So bottom line, this is dynamite structure. And uh, I'm not saying the airplane's easy to build because I ran into a bunch of other things later where I wasn't thinking straight. But this basic concept of doing a unitized bulkhead is indeed makes an airplane a lot easier to build. And we made four of those bulkheads. See this bulkhead down here, the sponsor wing? Up here outside our fixture, that's the inboard wing spar. And all we had to do is put those four bulkheads in and adjust them this way and this way. And then everything's all jigged, not even adjustable. So anyway, I was really excited, I still am really excited about a basic structural uh, design concept and build concept. Uh, I made a bunch of other mistakes though where the airplane is hard to build. Uh, it should have molded fuselage halves and instead we did a lot of work with, with, with foam and breathing dust and uh, it's a long story and it take me three times as long to build this airplane as I thought it would. So anyway, uh, I'll take some questions. Let me know how, what the time is. Are we done? Yeah, about 15 to 20 minutes or anyway, if wants to ask questions. I got one. Yeah. Do you have a washout built in that wing? I do. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's about right because the entire wing is installed at the same time. It's washed out two degrees. Uh, from root to tip. Keep in mind, it's more like a sailplane wing than a Piper Cup wing, a high aspect ratio. Washes out two degrees going out to that removable panel. By the way, the, the reason the panel is removable is the airplane with the wings folded. You saw it folded look, coming out of the water. That'll fit in a, in a single car garage if you take off those outer panels that are about that long. Um, the outer panel is that's just like a half degree of wash down. And then, of course, I have a lot of a sweep on the tip, which is something I've been using since the 80s. And finally, the airliner came out. The, the 787 has this big sheer, what we call a sheer tip instead of a winglet. Uh, by the way, I was the first one to fly with winglets. Now, the guy who invented winglets, you see them on all the airplanes now. There's plenty of things. The guy invented, uh, see, we're talking this. 1975, researcher at NASA, at NASA Ames. Uh, he came up with this idea of uh, being able to add wing that doesn't produce as much more bending as it would if you made the wing longer, and yet gets most of the advantage as if the wing were longer. Probably the best way to say it. Um, uh, It's so actually very easy and the very we can first airplane flight with wings. That's kind of a cool job. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the NASA guy, uh, he he heard that he saw that and he said, "Oh, this home builder is using your winglets." Here, only a few months after you unveiled, you know, 
they said, ah, they kind of you know, he's not a better man. He, was, he kind of poo pooed it, saying, yeah, he's probably just stuck to And then uh, a couple years later, he showed up at the Oshkosh show. And he was out there in a flight line looking at my winglets. And I walked up to him. I said, oh, you know, I've been wanting to meet you. You know, the first one that he says, I'd like to apologize to you. He says, he looked at the shape and the camber of the lower and upper winglet, and, and clearly you could tell that I did follow all of his rules as far as lift distribution. You know, a winglet's got to lift inward, and it does that to, to reduce the tip vortex. And, and he turned right around and just openly apologized. He said, you've done this properly. And then he went out and bragged about his winglets were, were on airplanes only four months after he unveiled them. <laughs> <laughs> and he thought it would take a decade, you know. So I don't know, it's, you know, once in a while you run a diesel master guys, you're just, they're just kind of fun to talk to. Uh, next question. I don't know, we know what to ask. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, any subject's okay. okay. I, I, I'm not really into this politically correct thing with colleges, so I might stumble if you ask me the wrong question. <laughs> your, your electric propulsion. I'm just curious how much that might cost, because I would love to build an electric ah, That's a good question. I think uh, there's a there's a Chinese version of that same motor that's like $250 or something. And the big giant scale model guys use it. But it's not very reliable. The uh, the, the German one, which is a real good motor, I believe it's around 800 bucks, okay. you know, for 13 horsepower. Uh, lithium batteries, probably per cell or probably twice that. Uh, the controller is something that Brent Regan, who's my neighbor, uh, he's the smartest guy I know. He, he does, uh, he, he has an electronics savant that works for him. And they do their own uh, circuit boards and software, and uh, they do the whole works. So um, I I don't know what that cost. You know, if he wanted to experiment, he didn't charge me for the board. I, I bought the batteries and the motors. I thought I've seen an electric plane flying around here three or four times. Do you have heard of anything in the great lines out there? I've seen one here uh, back in this 90s. I drove an electric car for seven years. And these greenies think I'm a, I'm a little warming uh, alarmist because I drove like the car back in the 80s. They're wrong. But, uh, um, the EV1, you know, the EV1, it's a cool little car. Lead acid batteries, 80 miles range of foil, really accelerated. It's a great, it's a great little car. Much better in many ways than the electric cars you can buy now because they're, uh, they're rolling friction, aerodynamic drag, and weight. Are, are much better than any electric car you can buy now. It's a little two-seater, fun car. Google it, EV1. Okay. I was a big fan of it, but they would only lease them. They never sold them, and they took it back and crushed them. Really? Yeah. Good movie called uh, Who, Killed, Who Killed the Electric Car. Okay. Yeah. EV1. Yeah. It's a... <clears throat> I'm pretty new. This is only my second semester, and uh, I'm still trying to figure out how many hands do you use to, to build an airplane? How many people? Well, for most of the airplane, I didn't work like I am now. Right now, I've got a real expert helping me. <laughs> so, you know, I can tell this guy, hey, go do this, and I don't have to watch him. In fact, he'll do it better than I can, and that's really handy. But when I started this, I was a real cheapskate. And uh, several guys said, gee, I want to learn. Can I just volunteer and come by and help you? So, so I would send out, when I had to do a big layup, when I, like I need five people to, to, you know, even with our slow epoxy, I, I had five people, one of them doing nothing but mixing. And a big thing like that integrated bokeh, and that's, that's a big layup. Take about five hours. Okay. I'd send out an email group to... Gosh, I think it was seven volunteers, something like that, and three or four of them would show up every time. And I'd feel sorry for them, so I'd, I'd, buy, uh, I'd buy them dinner. 
And then, you know, we sit around and, you know, I, I like to tell stories to the youngsters, you know, so we sit around and maybe uh, shoot the breeze for more time than the layup took, and it's kind of fun, but, but now, uh, uh, Dan Woodward, who's an artisan, who did my furniture for my house, uh, I worked him real hard when I was trying to get it to Oshkosh, and, and then Trevor came in and did the uh, tooling and the parts for the nacelles and the cowlings. That was his big job. And now, ever since about April or May, he's been doing the landing, the new landing gear. The airplane's done, though, except for painting. It really, it really is. It's, it's a, um, we were just gluing on some vortex generators last night to uh, to uh, tweak the skull kick twister. So I think I'll be able to retire pretty quick unless the airplane needs a lot more work. And if it doesn't, I think I'll burn it. <laughs> I, get, I get so old, I can hardly get in and out of it now. So, yeah, next question. I guess you have one more to uh, You still uh, offer opportunities to young college students like ourselves to maybe get the foot in the door and help out a little bit? I've brought several of his people from his class over before, uh, back when we were trying to get down. Gosh, why, why haven't we done that lately? Yeah, just to bring more money. Yeah. yeah, we haven't been doing the big layups and so on, but you know, I I don't hide things like I used to. Uh, when I was when I was working in a competitive business and I, and I had a, a company whose biggest job was building composite airplanes, an idea like this integrated bulkhead, we'd lock the door and not let anybody look at it. You know, once you get real old like me, I'm 73. Uh, I'm not trying to make money on this anymore, and I, I don't mind anybody looking at it. So, you know, you're welcome to go. Oh, you're going to come over and look at it, aren't you? Yeah. Pretty quick. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, let's see. Well, what, what do you think volunteers could help with? Uh, probably some on flight <laughs> test. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sandy. Sandy, a primer. Oh, you guys love the sand. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Yeah, I'll really tell you, I have sand a lot more carbon fiber than, than you'll ever come close to, I'll guarantee you. <laughs> and I'm still doing it occasionally. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to build another airplane. It's just too much work. I'll probably, I've got a couple designs for some pretty exciting things that I want to get built. So maybe somebody will put together a little team, maybe Trevor will, and, and build a new plane that will blow your socks off. What do you think? The, uh, Not that fun. Either the uh, supersonic electric airplane or the, uh, <laughs> or the uh, air combat thing would blow your socks off for sure. Uh, anyway, I, I've been, I'm still designing. I'll, I'll probably, I'll still be, you know, it's just kind of in my blood. I, I enjoy uh, uh, Trying new things in aerodynamics. That sounds like years of work in the opting in that little small conversation yeah. you just had. That's like your life's yeah. work now. Yeah. No, well, yeah. first of all, this guy was real experienced before I met him. Yeah, we he did build airplanes in several states and yeah. several continents. I mean, but so anyway, it was it was really it was really refreshing because I I thought when I moved up here from the the hotbed of airplane flight tests to, to the Mojave Desert. I thought I'd be up here with guys that just go hunting and fishing. You know, I really did. And I was surprised by, by some cool stuff that's going on. I mean, what you're doing right here, we didn't have back then. We, we didn't, didn't. And so I've been really, uh, really uh, pleasantly surprised. Uh, Murdo invited me even to be on the advisory board for the school here. And that, that was. That was fun. I don't think I listened to half of what I suggested. But <laughs> we hear you. We hear you. We don't move as quick as you, but we hear you. Well, I'll tell you what I told them. I said, so you, they, their schedule showed that, that the first week you teach people about safety. And I said, you know, I'll just bore them. <laughs> you know, learn about safety later after somebody loses an eye or something. <laughs> but, you, you know, I really wanted them to, uh, to have you do the stuff that was most fun. Because if you're not doing something that's fun, you're not going to chase it as a career. You might, but you're only doing it for money. 
if you're doing something that's fun and you make a career of it, you're not doing it for money, you're doing it for passion. And and the F work, you're doing it for fun. And that's how I that's how I ran my companies. And uh, right now I'm pretty proud to say that my 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 company has 650 employees and they're building the world's largest airplane and it's all carbon fiber. And that's really a cool thing to say after you after you retire. Yeah. What ambitions? If any, I know you're building this for your own personal satisfaction, this the ski goal. But do you have ambitions, uh, or do you think this will be a, a home kit someday? Uh, well, that will follow you know, that nature. I don't like to jump the gun. I don't Understood. know. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it work exactly like I wanted to on water. Okay. I think I've got a pretty good airplane for off and off the runways now, just from the testing. I don't see any issues that are hard there. Water thing's a lot harder. Uh, and I'll know that only after it gets warm enough to get a bag out of the lake. So I'm not in a big hurry, but here's the thing. Uh, I'm not gonna run a company to kit this. Uh, I've, I've really been trying my best to, to uh, retire. I, I did um, uh, 15 airplanes with my little home built airplane company. One of them was a Voyager that ran around the world non refueled in 86. We won the 30th anniversary of it in a couple of weeks. That's kind of cool. Um, but uh, uh, I sold plans for five different airplane types. Long, easy, very easy, defiant, solitaire, very big. I worked with 15,000 people that, that uh, had ambitions to build an airplane in the garage. Now, as you know, building airplanes is hard, even with a good set of plans. Only 10% of people that, 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 that buy a set of plans and go out and want to build an airplane ever fly it. 10%. And um, uh, if this thing works, I would like to see it as a, as a kid or a um, it can't be a light sport because it has retractable gear and it's um, it's um, uh, it's, it's designed for a, a speed that's way above what they limit to you on light sport and it really likes to cruise at 20,000 feet. You're only allowed to go to 10,000 above the ground for light sport. So it's not a light sport airplane. But those are little toys that you buzz around and you don't have a lot of range. This thing's got a real big baggage. You can unload the biggest Cadillac trunk into the package. And uh, so it's it's a different thing. It could be an experimental kit, just like the Long Easy was. Uh, now, there's a friend of mine whose job it is to uh, modify, rebuild, and repair Long Easies and Cozies and, you know, these composite home builds. And he lives and works in Lewiston. So he comes up once in a while and I give him my tools. So he's, in fact, he's building the new skis. He really wants to do that. I keep telling him he's crazy because it's too, it's, it's, it's a big job and he's already 62 years old. But uh, uh, I think somebody will probably want to do it. What, what I might end up doing is license someone to, to, to build it. Um, it's, I don't think anybody should build it like I did. They should receive molded fuselage halves and say, well, it was a lot of work, you know. So I think it would have to be uh, uh, structurally, uh, manufacturing-wise, redesigned before you go out and build another one. I look at it as a research program, because I was wanting to see if you could land on real rough water. Uh, it has a hole that you should be able to run right up on rocks. It has the saltwater compatibility. Uh, so I didn't build it for a business, but um, it, if it really works good, somebody will probably grab it and, and, uh, and, and want more. Quick one. Yeah. We have an instructor here that's been corrupting the airframe students saying that Sheet metal is a 
far superior method. What kind of metal? Aluminum. Aluminium? Yeah. It's a really? far better way of constructing airplanes than composite. Yeah. You know? What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, you know, the best answer to that, really, is the early airplanes were made out of wood and then steel tube welded together with cotton Memory. sheets on it and butyrate dope, you know. You've seen Piper Cup like. <clears throat> And then along came the idea that you could use uh, aluminum and build airplanes, and that caught on, even though it had some big uh, disadvantages from the standpoint of corrosion, and salt water particularly, and big disadvantages on fatigue. Uh, but what happened over the years, starting in the I think it was early 30s, when the first metal airplanes came out, over the years, they evolved a bunch of improvements, like you could buy aluminum sheets with alclad, which was pure aluminum on the surface, so it didn't corrode as bad. And you could build fixtures so that you could form a rib without cracking it in the corners. And so over a long period of time, there were an enormous amount of improvements made to the point where you could actually build an acceptable airplane out of aluminum, even an airliner or a Piper Cherokee, right? But I got to tell you one thing: that in the early 30s, we had a good epoxy, and we had the materials and techniques that you're doing right downstairs here. And if we move from that Piper Cub structure, into the kind of structure that, that your, uh, what do you have here, a cirrus or something, yeah. was built. Let's just assume that happened instead of aluminum. Okay, and then in 19, uh, when did I do my first, I say from 76 or so, uh, the Windecker came earlier with you know, polyester and some whatever, but, and of course the Starship, uh, which I, I did initial work for it. It certified in 88, I think, 89. <clears throat> but what happened? What would have happened if it was the other way around? You had composite airplanes, and then down there in the uh, uh, early 80s, excuse me, mid 70s, somebody came up with says, "Hey, look at this stuff, aluminum." Okay. It's not alcad, but it's aluminum, right? And well, how are you going to attach it? If you glue it together, and you know, temperature changes, it's pop apart. And I, well, well, what I do, and I'll drill holes in, or overlap it, and I'll mash a piece of it way beyond the elastic limit, so that it just crushes down. And, well, that's not very strong, but, oh, well, I'll put in 30 holes every inch, every foot or something, you know, you do it like this. And, well, yeah, that sort of works, but it's not very good for fatigue and how you repair it. And, and my God, this guy's got one out, out in Seattle, he's kind of close to the ocean, and the thing disappears and you can't repair it. Uh, I can tell you that if aluminum was done after composites, you would never get it certified. It was never accepted from the standpoint of, of its susceptibility to cracks and fatigue and just plain failures. You can't, if you do a spar like that, there's no way the spar is going to just turn into two pieces, right? It's not. <laughs> but aluminum, you know, if, if you've got a scratch in it particularly and you, you move it a lot, it just might come apart. And, and I just, I, I, I've got a lot of experience in it. I've done a lot of certification programs, even though I haven't done a type certificate for myself, but I've worked with a lot of companies that did it. I was on the, uh, the certification structure review board all the whole time the Starship was done. So I know what that's all about. And I looked at the hell they went through with the FAA to get that certified, and the margins that they had to do at work. But anyway, I can tell you that if somebody came up with composites in the late, uh, with aluminum in the late 70s and said, here, do that, I don't believe 
that would have gotten over the hurdle of being accepted as a human carrying airplane. And that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. Perfect. And I built my first airplane just, just for practice. I built outer wing panels out of aluminum on my wooden airplane. Just wanted to see how it was done, you know. And I, I was in there riveting and, uh, you know. You can apply that same thing to boats. For all of you boats, they're all glass now. Well, I'm not a boat person. No, I know. It's too, too it's no, everything's no. all glass now. You don't see a lot of aluminum boats in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's been 45 minutes, so what do you think? Should we go to the hangar? I'm happy to do Q&A at the hangar, too, if you want. It's called the Honey Badger Hideout. I'll show everybody on the record. Honey Badgers. Here. Um, I'm going to carpool and show them on uh, maps where it is. <laughs>